confess our disapprove of his actions as Secretary of the Treasury. With his bank and funding system, he is recreating here the rottenness and corruption of England. I have now become convinced of several facts. Mr. Jefferson is at the head of a faction hostile to me and my administration. He attacks the funding of the debt, the bank. I know that he has instituted a whispering campaign bent on subverting my projects. For Hamilton, banks permit the amassing of money, capital that is needed to stimulate industry. Hamilton believes that it is industry above all that will create opportunities for ordinary people to succeed and for the United States to become the meritocracy he envisions. A nation of mere farmers lacks the spirit of enterprise. A nation of manufacturers and merchants gives energy to a people. The most intelligent minds are wasted if they are confined to menial pursuits. But if a variety of industry is available in the community, men can make use of all the capacities and rise to the proper element. Hamilton is convinced that the United States must develop industry and commerce if it is ever to become a great nation. Jefferson has a very different vision for the country. He wants America to remain primarily rural, independent farmers working the land with little interference from government. Jefferson and his allies see Hamilton's powerful central government as a potent threat to individual liberty. They wanted a different kind of country. See, they don't want a bureaucracy, they don't want a standing army, they don't want any of the attributes of a European state. They don't want any of the things that Hamilton wants for the United States. Urbanization, industrialization, finance capital, they don't want this. They want agriculture, independent farmers. Jefferson, you know, believes that the only honest profit is made by the man who tills the soil. And everything that Hamilton wanted must have seemed like a nightmare to them. Almost all of the other founders were very suspicious of bankers and financiers as kind of parasitic paper pushers. Jefferson, Madison, even Adams saw banks, for instance, as scams just to fleece the uh, public. Thomas Jefferson is particularly vocal in his opposition. Hamilton, with his bank stocks and government bonds, has caused our citizens to withdraw from useful industry and busy themselves with gambling and the destruction of morality. Jefferson, you know, believes that the only honest profit is made by the man who tills the soil and I always think of course he never personally tilled the soil he had slaves who took care of that for him but there's some idea that you ought to be able to see what you produced you ought to be able to hold it in your hands or eat it or some and I, I always think of Jefferson as wanting to bite the money to make sure it's solid not a very profound understanding of what in modern times we understand about finances At noon on April 30th, 1789, George Washington was sworn in as the first president of the United States in New York City from the balcony of the old city hall, which New Yorkers had optimistically renamed Federal Hall. The new president quickly brought in Thomas Jefferson to be secretary of state, though the Virginian loathed New York, which he called a sewer filled with all the depravities of human nature. Alexander Hamilton, just 33, was named the nation's first Secretary of the Treasury. And though the appointment came through on a Saturday, he went right to work. From his new office in the Treasury Department on Broadway, a few steps from newly rebuilt Trinity Church, Hamilton began mapping out the blueprint for a new kind of nation, one based not on plantations and slave labor, but on commerce, manufacturing, 
and immigrant toil. To a startling degree, he was mapping out the future of New York. Look at what he understood in a country that was 90% agrarian. Here's a man who understood that the future of the country was in manufacturing. Here's a man who understood what banking could do to develop the economy of the country. How you could use tax money from the many, put it in the hands of the few, and produce, as a result, a manufacturing revolution, the beginnings of industrialization in a country that was, what, two decades old. Southern planters immediately rose up in opposition to Hamilton's program. The mobs of great cities, Jefferson warned, add just so much to the support of pure government as sores do to the strength of the human body. Certain the nation's future lay not in the city, but in the countryside. Jefferson insisted the capital be moved out of New York to a rural setting just across the Potomac from his native Virginia. It was the beginning of a fateful split in American life, one that would pit South against North, country against city, and lead ultimately to civil war. Jefferson had this vision of the country being an agrarian country full of yeoman farmers. It was a vision that never existed even in his time, um, certainly not as he would have liked to have seen it. Um, but he loved that vision and he hated all things commercial. Hamilton loved commerce, he understood money, banking and money and flow of power through the economy. Unlike Jefferson, who never understood money at all, and which may account for why he was born one of the richest people in the colonies and died deeply, deeply in debt. Already, this split between a commercial manufacturing society and an agrarian staple crop based society between dynamic capital and capital that was invested in property and slaves and not as manipulable. These splits were already evolving given Hamilton's programs for the new nation. Federalists want to increase the power of the presidency, Republicans to diminish it. Federalists want a permanent army, Republicans think the militia can do the job. Federalists think that liberty is in danger from the people, Republicans think liberty is in danger from the government. <laughs> 